On today's program, we visit Magdala and Capernaum in Galilee. ICEJ President Dr. Jürgen Bueller concludes his series on Villa 1C. And we meet ICEJ Canada's Sault Ste. Marie and Algoma, Ontario representatives, Reverend Dr. John and Judy Haworth. Matthew 15, verses 29 through 31. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing their lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing and they praise the God of Israel. I'm here with Father Timothy at Magdala in Magdal in the Galilee. It's great to meet nice you, Nice to meet Father you all. Timothy. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a very exciting location where we're at. Can you tell us how you got involved with Magdala? Yes, well, in, uh, in 2006, one of our priests, a priest from our congregation, the Legionaries of Christ, Father John Solana, he came down to the, the Galilee area and he had a desire in his heart during prayer to uh, build a public sanctuary in honor of the, uh, of the public life of Jesus. So we started, we were able to buy the land, which used to be called Hawaii Beach. People came really? down here <laughs> and uh, they had their bungalows all built along, along the, uh, the property here. And they would come down for their weekends to swim in the lake. And then Father was able to buy this land and uh, we were going to just build a pilgrim house and the center for the, uh, for the public life of Jesus. And then we started discovering all of the, all of the archeology. span So that was in 2009 when we started digging and uh, you'll see everything that we found here uh, underneath the ground for 2000 years. It's a very exciting project. Yeah. You, you had no idea that you nope. were in the middle of an archeological dig. N none at all. So this represents a first century synagogue? Everything in the town is first century. All right. After the Jewish revolt in the year 66, 67 here, the, uh, the Jewish community leaves. And so there's nothing built after that. In many other places here in the Holy Land, you find the different time periods. Here you just find first century. And uh, of the more than 2,300 coins that we found here, all of them are in that time period of the first century. So where are those coins today? Ah, well, we have a lot of them in our storage. They have to be, re they right. have to be restored and renewed and studied. And uh, some of the others, the more important ones are down in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, because Israel antiquities would have a keen interest right, in, right. in archiving that. Right, right, right. So we found everything here is first century. So the synagogue obviously is first century. And in all of Israel now, up until now, they've only found seven. This we believe is one of the most well-kept and it's the only one that has the mosaics and the frescoes and then the Magdala stone that we found that we'll so talk we'll about. So we'll get to see these, these y items, Yes, we right? will, yes. What, how is this significant to Christians? Well, this is uh, really, when we started, we thought the public life of Jesus and then uh, God has this underground for 2000 years and we said, yeah, no, preserved. this isn't just for Christians. This is a crossroads yes. between Jewish and Christian history it is. because we have the synagogue of the Jewish community, right. but we're on the pathway of Jesus who walks through here. Right. And we know from the gospel of Luke that Jesus went out through all of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues, healing and curing the sick right. and preaching the kingdom of God from Capernaum <laughs> to here. This is the only other yeah. synagogue. So yeah. we believe that he was in the synagogue preaching the gospel in the first century here with us. Wow, yeah. Very good. Uh, Father Timothy, what's the long-term goal here? Well, the, the, the most important goal that we have here is the service of the people who come to visit us here and who are able to experience, have a first century experience in our, in our 21st mm -hmm. century mm -hmm. atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So the, the digging was very important so that we could uh, make this available to everybody and they could experience what was going on here mm -hmm. and uh, in the holy place that it is for the Jewish and then also for the Christians who, who come here to see uh, on the gospel trail to see where Jesus preached and where he, where he walked and where he taught. We want to offer a pilgrim center that we're building now uh, so the people can come here and not just come through and go back, mm 
right. but to come and experience Various. and be able to pray here and read the gospel and meditate and reflect. And then we've also built the Duke and Altum Center that we'll see later, which is, uh, which is built in two parts. One part is also another vocation that we felt here, which is not only being open to all cultures like up in the, in the Jewish and the mm -hmm. Christian cultures, mm -hmm. but also uh, because this is the hometown of Mary from Magdala, right. we have here the Mary Magdalene Institute for the Dignity of Woman. And we're going to be promoting that uh, with, through our prayer and right. very actively for the culture of the dignity of woman. It's women in ministry that is your focus, which is yes. a very exciting one. Yes, yes. Mary from Magdala, she's yeah. the, the apostle <laughs> of the apostles. After the resurrection, Jesus sends her and says, go and tell my, yeah, my disciples. Yeah, so yeah. women have a very, very important role. There's a lot of healing to be done in the hearts of women, right. a lot of cultural change to be done. Right. But then there's a great field of, of ministry and openness for women to, to do a lot of good in this world. That's exciting. Thank you, Father. No, thank you. Up next, ICEJ President Dr. Jürgen Bühler concludes his series on the 1C Conference. We are here in Berlin Wannsee at Villa Wannsee, the place where the infamous Wannsee Conference was taking place, the conference that was planning and scheming the murder of 11 million Jews that were living in Europe. Mr. Stegen, can you please explain us what is this center all about? The Wannsee Conference is known as the most important government conference on the Holocaust in Nazi times. It was held on 20th of January 1942, and it was a meeting of high-ranking SS and government and party officials to discuss the ongoing Holocaust. Authorities sit together here in Wannsee and discuss the implementation of a mass murder. Who is going to be deported? How much time do we need in order to get a replacement for those Jews who are in industry? And I think that is what the Wannsee Conference is for then, that it is something where high-skilled, educated government bureaucrats discuss their perspective on a mass murder plan. Most of the minute language is euphemism, things are being concealed and, and hidden. There is one sentence, and I will quote from my head, where it says that Jews are to be utilized for work in the East in a suitable manner, and that a large number of them will drop out by way of natural attrition. And that is nothing else than murder by setting them to work. You work them to death. Yes. And it cannot be interpreted in, other, any fa in any other fashion. And the sentence then continues. It says, those who should ultimately possibly get by will have to be given a suitable treatment because they constitute a natural elite that, if allowed to be free, will turn into a germ cell of renewed Jewish revival. It is a clear language that states that suitable treatment can be nothing else than death because if it will constitute a germ cell, there is a threat in it and a certain danger. How important is uh, this museum, uh, how do you think, today? When it opened in 1992, it was a museum that had the function to tell the story for a first time. Mm -hmm. Places of the perpetrators as a memorial site is something that hadn't been there before. You've got memorials and monuments where we face the victims, where we mourn, where we pray for the victims, where we see graveyards, killing sites, and we are with the victims. Today, I think the uh, house has an important stand again um, because places as such are being questioned. The necessity is being questioned. Clearly, we are now in a situation where people fear to wear a kippah on street, where people fear to wear a star of David. And that is shameful and that is hurtful. This is something that needs education, that needs to be addressed, and uh, where we as a house are challenged to do better.
The main lesson that it brings to my life is to be reminded in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, where Jeremiah says, the human heart is deceptive above all things and it is incurable sick who can understand it. That means we need to be people of prayer, constantly drawing close to the presence of God and allowing him to speak to us. We need to be people of the word of God, where we sharpen our conscience according to the oracles and the commandments of God. And thirdly, we need to be people filled with the Holy Spirit, a spirit that is guiding us and directing us and warning us from any false doctrine that comes to our lives. And with this lesson here from Villa Vance, I want to encourage you to make sure that history will not repeat itself again. May the Lord bless you here from Berlin. Up next, Biblical Insights from Capernaum. This pillar is speaking about a donation that was made by the family of the Zabadis. What do we learn from that? We learn, first of all, that donors don't like to stay anonymous at times, and the Zabadis were giving money and they wanted their name on the pillars. That is acceptable because they want their children and grandchildren to know that. But who were the Zebedees? The two disciples, John and James. That means that since this is from the fifth century, you understand that they kept on leaving here. Because I told you, Peter and Andrew and Philip were not here from here, they were from Bethsaida. So when we come here and we see a lot of ruins, and some people can think, oh gee, archaeology again, boring stones. The stones are speaking to you. That's right. They tell you what was the income. Mm -hmm. We learn now that some were fishermen. Right. Now when we look and see the wall around, we know how many people lived here in total. 1,500 people. Wow. Wow. The village of Cana had the, the same number. Nazareth of Jesus had 400 people. No wonder that Nathaniel of Cana will ask cynically, what good can come out of Nazareth? Because it was a small place. Right. And it's like we tease one another if somebody will tell me, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to this village. I can ask in Hebrew, well, what have you forgotten there? What good can come out of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth is the biggest town in the Galilee Cana is still a village. <laughs> Interesting. Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I'm Dr. John Howarth, and my wife Judy is here, and uh, we want to share some of our heart for Israel and uh, lessons we've learned and also how we want to help the nation of Israel uh, for her safety and protection and well-being and also the people and um, both uh, Jewish and non-Jewish as well. I was a pastor in Ontario, uh, four different churches over 30 years. And uh, the first time I went to Israel was in 1992 when I was a senior pastor at Grace Church in Newmarket. And I just fell in love with the land. I fell in love with the people and um, John Hagee said that when he first went to Israel, he went over as a tourist, but by the time he came home back to Texas, he was a Zionist. And that's what happened to me. And um, the Lord has given me opportunity to, uh, to arrange and plan and lead uh, 25 tours to Israel. And I've seen whole churches changed 
by people going to Israel. I've seen lives changed. And as you know, it, it opens up the Bible. It makes the Bible come alive. So the Lord gave me a real heart for his people and his land starting in 1992. And um, have been over there leading tours 25 times. And after I retired from pastoral ministry, the Lord opened up uh, some doors for me. I wanted to serve the Lord by serving his people and his land. And I became the first executive director for Christians United for Israel in Canada and was there for several years. And then a mission asked me to join them. And uh, the leaders of the mission were former parishioners of mine, and I became the Middle East representative for High Adventure Ministries. And their ministries started uh, in the early 70s with a radio station in Jerusalem, and they broadcast the gospel. And working with them, I was able to have the privilege of organizing and leading three work trips where we took Christian people from Canada and we would go and we would glean the fields, we would um, paint uh, community centers for the Ethiopian Jews who had come, and we worked at soup kitchens and food banks, and we learned that there's quite a bit of poverty in some segments of the Israeli society. The the Russian Jews that came starting in the 1980s, and over a million of them have come from Russia, they, they've come with nothing. And before you can work and get a job, you have to learn Hebrew. And so it's a, it's a big ordeal to, to go there. You're liberated from the persecution and opposition that you've lived with as Jewish people in Russia, for example but it's a slow process to get assimilated into the society there and get a job and find a house and everything like that. The other group of uh, uh, disadvantaged people are the uh, Ethiopian Jews who have come by the thousands over the last few years and they came with less than the Russians had when they came to Israel. So we've been involved over the years uh, helping these two groups and then there are the, um, the Arabs, the non-Jews, in Israel, and, and we've worked for them as well, um, doing different projects to encourage them. And it's been wonderful to see how the Lord Jesus is building his church among the Arab people. And I've had firsthand uh, experience with how Jesus is doing his own pre evangelism through dreams and visions. And uh, I've seen Arab lives transformed because Jesus. Uh, encourage these people to seek after him. It's just been marvelous. I, I've had the privilege of baptizing uh, some Arab brand new Christians in the Jordan River and uh, I could tell you so many stories about that. But we also have a, our main ministry is to organize and recruit Christians from Canada, take them over to Israel, see the main sites and um, watch how God the Holy Spirit just opens the scriptures to them. It changes how they read the Bible. And uh, again, I've, I've seen lives changed after going to Israel. And if a handful of people come from the same church, for example, I've seen the whole churches impacted and renewed because of this. So that's our main ministry. And uh, the last tour we led was back in February of 2019. And we had 33 people there. Uh, most of them were first timers. And they, they're still talking about that trip. And some of them want to go again. And people are asking us, when's the next time you're going? We want to go with you. And my goal is to ask the Lord to do in their lives what he did in mine. I, I, I want these Christians to come back and uh, be good ambassadors for the nation of Israel and support her. So at the end of this month, September 24th, we're going to be having our first prayer meeting in our home uh, for Israel. And it's going to be an educational time as well as a time of prayer. I want to keep everybody who attends updated on what's happening in Israel, why it's happening, how we need to pray for them. And we're starting by inviting people who have come with us to Israel uh, since the early 90s 
And this is in Sault Ste. Marie and the Algoma district of North, Northeast Ontario. So we're excited about that. And uh, I, I just have a heart. The Lord's given me a heart and uh, a passion for his people there and his land. And so I, I'm what is called a Christian Zionist. And I believe three things about Christian Zionism. Um, as with all Zionists, I believe that Israel has the right to exist as a Jewish state. Secondly, I believe that if attacked, which often happens, the Jewish state has the right to defend herself. The third thing that Zionists believe in is that they have the right to all the land that God gave them starting way back in Genesis chapter 17. And they never have been able to inhabit all the land that God gave them because of opposition from the Canaanites and so on. There, there was disobedience that came uh, among the tribes and everything. But uh, that's, that's their portion of land that God has given them. And um, I feel very strongly that they have the right to, uh, to own and possess that land right from God. So this is, this is my wonderful wife, Judy. <laughs> Uh, we were married seven years ago, and uh, uh, so my first time to Israel was on our honeymoon, and, and John said it, it won't be restful, it won't be private, but it'll be unforgettable, which was very true. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been able to go um, four times since then, and uh, um, it just has been great to learn so much about the land, about the people, and uh, um, be able to pray more um, um, knowledgeably. But our trip with ICJ, especially, it was different um, than our other uh, tours because we got to see what ICJ is doing, you know, helping the um, Holocaust survivors and uh, uh, a home for um, deaf children and uh, um, bringing a, a, a bomb shelter, you know, right close to Gaza. and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and just a number of different projects that uh, we could see firsthand um, how ICAJ is, is using the funds that, that people are, are giving and people are praying and, and just really helping in a practical way mm -hmm. uh, for um, needy people in Israel and, and just sharing the love of God. Yeah. Yeah. In the 25 times that I've been to Israel, I've had the privilege of serving with other Christian Zionist organizations like ICEJ, and they all are good. They all have uh, uh, different strengths, and they're working in certain areas. But I've never seen uh, one organization like ICEJ that are doing so many different things across the spectrum of the needs that are there spiritually, physically in Israel. And uh, boy, like Judy says, that trip really opened my eyes to what ICEJ's goals were. And um, when we were asked to become volunteer representatives, then we agreed and um, we're very privileged to be uh, in partnership with ICEJ because they're doing such a tremendous work. They have more offices in more countries in the world than any other good organization that I know of and I've worked with some of them so it's an honor yeah. Yeah. Hi I'm Donna Holbrook a National Executive Director of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem Canada Audrey Ruth Peer was one of our members who came to know about the work of the ICJ in bringing comfort here and she passed away as an only child and with no children of her own. She had two regrets in her life. One was that she didn't have children and the other one that she never came to the land of Israel. So when she passed away, she left an estate. I shared it with her friend, Pat, who knew her for over 60 years. And I said, Pat, what do you think Audrey would like? How we use her funds? So music was important to her, children, also important to her. And so we undertook the fun and we divided it four ways equally. And it went to a petting zoo for children, for orphan boys near Tel Aviv. 
It also went to build two new music rooms at Bet Yosef up at Haifa, which is a very large community center. We also helped to complete a playground for another orphanage to the south of Israel. And then it enabled us to restore our scholarship for Christian young adults. And even though she was never in Israel, her name is in the land on those three projects. And it continued for five years on our Canadian scholarship for Christian leaders who have never been to Israel, who are in the age group of 17 to 30. Would you consider being a Shomer, Keep of Israel, in your state giving? And that, that leaves a wonderful legacy here in Israel. We conclude our program today with some sights and sounds within Israel. Thank you for joining us today, and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. And for our Canadian residents, be sure to ask for your free Canada-Israel pin. Through your contributions to ICEJ Canada, you can participate by giving to Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield Bomb Proof Shelters, Mentoring Programs, Aliyah Support, Children's Projects, Israel in Crisis, Israel Aid, Gan David Adam Emergency Services, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, Scholarships for Young Adult Leaders, ICEJ Canada Media Fund, Gift Estate Securities Fund.